welcome to the show, Don. Would you like to tell our audience a little bit about yourself, please? Uh, I'd love to. Uh, my name is Don Marklin. I'm the founder and head coach of Accountability Now. We're, I'm a global uh, a coaching firm with 26 clients in seven different countries. I also run sales and marketing for a digital marketing agency out of Las Vegas, Nevada called 411 Locals. And we're that this business, we're also just launching into Australia and Canada where we do uh, digital marketing uh, and SEO work uh, for small businesses and help them get found online. Fantastic. So you're a busy fella. And ha what have you noticed on, you know, during this recent last 12 months where we talked in the, you know, before we came live on air about the changes and things like that. So has you has your business model had to change to adapt to this? Um, well, I, you know, I was lucky that I, I've been kind of a virtual worker for years. Um, but I have noticed that, um, and I wrote about this in one of my Forbes articles, I write for Forbes. And one of the things that I've noticed, and I strongly encourage every entrepreneur to pay attention to is virtualization isn't going away, even though, you know, COVID or pandemia might change or mutate into new things. Virtualization won't your customers want it now. Your employees want it now. And so you have got to adapt to virtualization. And, and that's what's been really great for my business coaching because I've helped a lot of companies all over the world implement uh, virtualization strategies, as well as my digital marketing agency is, is helping companies get found online and find new virtual strategies to grow their business. And do you think, John, one of the things I noticed, you know, working with some, uh, some you know, sales guys who are used, have been spent 20 years in person, face to face, and I noticed, you know, in the first few months, they, they really didn't get the virtual selling bit because they thought it was just a temporary thing. That's and right. now I think, as you say, reality has dawned that they're not going to be charging around the country all, all the time like they were once before. Is that how it's in the States as well? That's right. It's 100% it, right, Trevor. It's, they, they were very slow to adopt it, thinking, hey, I'm, I'm going to get back on a plane any day and I'm going to be in person. And they've had to adjust how they connect with people. And, and this is what I think everybody's got to remember that all sales really is, is about relationships and how can you build relationships. And, and I know that's simplistic, but it's also very accurate. And you can have great relationships virtually with people. You can still just as ha have as powerful and potent of a connection with somebody virtually. And it, it just you just can't feel the energy of the room you can't physically interact with them but everything else is the same you've just got to still just do the work and take the time to build it yeah i, I did i i delivered a webinar this morning and um you know that was always a big challenge because you know like yourself i'm sure you like being that sort of energy in the in the front line when you're in front of people but I've started delivering webinars standing up now. I've adjusted all my camera positions so I can do yeah. them standing up. And, it, and and people tell me it does bring the energy to it. So, uh, yeah, it is, it is a, a very different situation. Now, Don, one of the things I know you want to share with our listeners on the podcast today is about your four C's of accountability, which I'm, I, I understand are you know, great tips that will help them grow their sales and become better, better at sales. So are you happy to share those four C's yeah. of accountability? So thank you for asking about that. So, you know, and I'll, I'll give it a little bit of a context. You know, when I was in my mid twenties, I was 26 years old. I was a vice president of sales and marketing for a call center company in Northern Utah. And I was struggling with uh, everything. Or I weighed about 70 pounds more than I weigh now. I really struggled with this concept called work-life balance. I don't know if you've heard of work-life balance, but I, it wasn't work-life balance for me. It was work, 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 life balance. It was a mess. My favorite restaurant was Taco Bell, right? I went there <laughs> three or four times a week. I was a mess. And as I was really struggling, uh, I remember I was one day, I was in a training room in Rock Falls, Illinois, thinking... I can't get 1500 employees to even do what I want them to do, let alone live up to my own expectations. There's got to be something better than this. And I had read all these books on personal development and tried to figure it out. And that's when kind of lightning struck me on this concept of clarity. And it came in the term accountability. Accountability, as I wrote it down, is the glue that ties commitment to results. That's what it is. And I, I still have the notebook today that I wrote it down in. And I wrote down these four C's of accountability. And the four C's are really simple. The first C is you critique success. 
which is you do it better every time. You never reach the mountaintop. Whatever you do well, before you break your wrist, pat yourself on the back, you surround yourself with people that'll critique it so you can make it better. You never rest on your laurels. The second one is you correct failure. Every great person fails significantly more than they succeed. Mozart and Beethoven, we only listen to less than 3% of their actually recorded works. Most of their stuff is a dismal failure. Nobody even knows what it is, but they're considered the greatest composers in classical music history. So you have to correct failure. When you make mistakes, you don't punish it, you correct it and move forward. The third one is you celebrate growth. The hardest thing in life to do is grow, right? If you go to the weight room, right? It's a choice to take the 13th rep or put more weight on the bar. So we celebrate that we don't celebrate success because success is expected. I expect the Trevors of the world to be successful, right? Why would I celebrate you meeting expectations that builds entitlement? I celebrate the choice to grow the 13th rep or the fifth, you know, doing the hard things. That's what we celebrate. And the fourth thing is we crush mediocrity and mediocrity is things we have in our lives. It's when we shirk, it's when we are lazy, when we cut corners, whatever it is for everybody, we crush it with all, you know, ferociousness and passion that we can. And when I developed the four C's, it got me through, you know, when my wife went through cancer, when I, uh, you know, when we bounced between jobs, when I had a failed business, when, I mean, you name it, all these things, the glue that ties commitment to results is what helped me not only start and sell a business, do, uh, sell different uh, uh, products and services, start the business that I have now or write for Forbes. Everything came down to doing what I said I was going to do and the commitment, uh, the glue that ties my commitment to my results. So in terms of those, those four C's, uh, Don, how do you how do you implement those into a business that you'll be working with? Uh, you know, just to give a bit of listeners a bit of a flavor, how you can take those and actually make them work. So, uh, you know, everybody has heard about a, hey, your business needs to have value statements and vision statements and mission statements and those types of things. And, uh, Ray Dalio and his book principles really does a great job outlining how important values are for a business. And so in, we, in my coaching practice, when I work with small business owners all over the world, one of the first things we do is we go through and look at what are the values? What is the tribal vernacular? of the business and accountability is just one word. And that's why I break it down to the four C's and say, okay, we're going to implement not only all four of these into the vernacular of the business, but now we're going to put tactical behavioral things to reinforce those. For example, whenever somebody does well, before we give bonuses out, before we do, you know, performance uh, rewards, we're going to review the success and have scorecards from outside people to review what did well. Hey, did you just close that $1.5 million deal? Great. Before you get commission, you have to have these three people review it on why it wasn't 1.6 million or why it didn't close <laughs> sooner. Right. And so we put practices in place that reinforce the four C's through the whole business. In my last business, we were in, in the tax industry. And we made probably close to 25% of our annual revenue between January and, uh, and April 15th in the US. And every April 20th, we had what we call the Four C's meeting. Even though we did so well, and it was such an amazing run every year, we would sit down as an entire leadership team and destroy it. We would rip it apart and find all these opportunities to make it better. And that's how we got better every single year. And in three and a half years, when I was chief revenue officer and an owner of that business, we grew it from 35 million almost to 90 million in three and a half years, all built on the wow. back of the four C's. So, so Don, when you're working with the, with the sales guys on, uh, on, on the four C's, I can imagine that, you know, the, the, the new, the keen, the enthusiastic ones, the ones who want to prove their worth and really, you know, make it great. I'm, I'm sure, you know, I can see them all going, yeah, let's go for this. But how do you, how do you adapt this with someone who's been there 20 years and, you know, thinks, oh, this is, you know, this is kind of the, you know, X flavor of the month almost. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and thinks, oh, you know, it'll not work for me. You know, I'm, I'm happy with what I'm doing. You know, I, I don't think I can get any better. How do you get those people to realize that they can get better? Yep. 
Yeah, you know, what you're talking about is the ego. If I'm going to go into my Freudian uh, mindset and talk about how to manage an ego. And in salespeople, there are lots of egos. And so one of the uh, things that I teach all sales leaders all over the world, I teach them this rule. And this is an ancient rule about salespeople. All salespeople are babies. Now, I say that I'm a salesperson. And so I have the right to say that all salespeople are babies because we are. All of us are babies. And so knowing that they're babies, when somebody has a big ego, there are two ways to beat an ego. The first way is to just absolutely outcompete, right? Is you ignore what they say and teach it to all the other people until they start to lose to other performers. And then they will improve their performance to get on top because egos always want to win. So that's the first way is you always beat an ego. The second way, and this is a slower way, but it works, is you have to make that ego feel like it's their idea. So if I've got that person that says, hey, I'm good enough, I am not. I don't need to try new things, these are the flavor of the month, and they are there on every team, you're gonna have those people. I will slow down. I will usually pull three or four of them into a committee and start talking to them about, hey, I'm trying to change the culture. You're so smart. You're the smartest guy in the room. How can we do that? And I will go through a slow, um, you know, uh, Socratic method until they start to help me come up with a new four C's for this team that now they're a champion of because it's their genius idea. And now they're going to be the leaders of this. And that's how you, so you use their ego rather than compete with it. Wow, I love that. I love the psychology of that. I think that's terrific. And, uh, and no doubt those four C's are very close to yours in the end. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly every time. Yeah, and but they feel like it's theirs. And it, it comes back to what Harry Truman said in the United States, where he said, you know, you can get as much as you want in this life as you might, as long as you don't care who gets the credit. <laughs> I don't care if they if it's their four C's and they run with it. That That's fine. That's why you can get my stuff for free. And that's why we're talking about it here as long as it works hey that's that's really what matters now don do you think given your experience i mean some can anybody be a salesperson do you think uh, i have seen this firsthand that anybody can be a salesperson for two reasons number one sales is disciplined practice right so it is absolutely just disciplined practice it's like any skill confidence is a skill right? If you wanted to, you know, Trevor, if you wanted to go be a great golfer, you could be a great golfer. It doesn't mean you could be a professional golfer, but you could be a great golfer through discipline practice, enough sacrifice and discipline practice. And sales is the same way. You just need to follow discipline practice. But the second thing why that I think is important is you're already great at sales because sales, all it is, is relationships and influencing people to make decisions. Sales is not putting on a plaid suit and sticking used cars down people's throats. That is not sales. That is screwing people over. That is a different job. And that's a gross job. Sales is the accountant convincing his boss, hey, I think I should have this much budget. That's sales. And that's what they're doing. Sales is IT trying to win more budget so they can go buy marketing automation software right? Uh, sales is a husband convincing a wife, I should go to, we should go to this restaurant as opposed to that one, that everybody is involved in that every day. And that's why I know you can be great at sales with the right techniques, with the right practice, and with the right relationships. So, so does that make in any organization, Don, does that make sales more important than marketing? It does. It absolutely does. And I have seen this firsthand where I have seen companies with brilliant marketing engines producing countless leads, but because they had no net to catch it, no group ready to facilitate a nurturing environment, maybe from the fronters or the setters to the closers, all that was wasted money. It would be the same as just taking dollar bills and throwing it right in a, sh in a shredder, right? And so, it, I mean, it's hard to always say which one's more important, Right. But I always know salespeople, they can go out and get their own leads. I've seen that. And I'm sure you've seen that in your career. Like, hey, go out and get your own leads. Go, go find somebody, go knock a door, go make a call. Right. But, and so that's why I always say sales is more important because they can, through their work, make it, make it happen. And you have to have that in place.
Now, just to round all this up, Don, this is this is great stuff. And I, I've just got a couple of big questions to put you on the spot with to finish, OK? Because okay. uh, <laughs> based on it. your experience. So first question I want to ask you is if there is one thing that you could say to every, you know, every entrepreneur who's listening to this podcast needs to learn to improve their sales, what would it be? Uh, they need to not be afraid to make decisions on employees. They are right now, every single entrepreneur has an employee or a salesperson on their team that is not carrying their weight. And so remember the, remember the, the term about dead weight. If you have an employee on your team that is dead weight that you are not making decisions on, then you're the dead weight. Okay, that is, that is the concept of dead weight. Make the decision right now because it's hurting your team. They're, it's, they're, it's just holding them back. I guarantee it. That's really interesting. That I remember working with an organization uh, a couple of years ago, and it became very apparent that their focus was on uh, investing in the people who weren't very good, rather than the people who were good, because they thought they couldn't get any better. And they were, they were determined that the ones who weren't very good would get better regardless. And of course, they never were. So that's, that's, a, that's a great point, actually. That's a really, really great point. And my final question then is, you know, is, is based on your experience and because people love to hear about, you said about, you know, correcting failure. So do you, do you see a big mistake that is commonly made by entrepreneurs, which you would, you would share with the audience today to say, watch out for this in case you make it? Uh, yeah, I, I, the most common mistake is um, they, there's two kind of common mistakes. One is they don't, they try to do everything themselves. It's the founder syndrome. I'm the founder, I'm an entrepreneur. So therefore I have to do everything. So surround yourself with a team. Okay, surround yourself with very talented people and trust them to be able to do it. And then the second thing, and I know this sounds like I'm plugging myself, but there's data that backs it up. Hire or work with a coach or somebody that gives you, gives you outside insight, outside insight to push yourself to be better. 70% of people that work with a coach or an experienced professional will uh, have seen uh, almost 90% improvement above those that don't, right? And that's backed up through data. That isn't just me riffing it off. Uh, and I, I, I can't, well, that doesn't mean you have to hire me, hire anybody. And I'm not saying hire a consultant. Consultants, a different world. I'm talking somebody who's done it, who's answered payroll, who knows your industry. That is the biggest thing that'll change your business is game changer. Great stuff. Now that's a neat segue actually, Don, into uh, me asking you. So if people are listening to this and they do want to get in touch with you, how do they do that? So uh, first of all, you can find me online on Twitter at Don Markland or Instagram executivecoach.don. You can go to my website, accountabilitynow.net. You can get your own ebook, which goes through the four C's of accountability. You can get that for free. You can also buy the paperback on Amazon, but you can get it for free. And, and I also have my online course for anybody that wants to get their employees in an online course to learn all of this stuff. It's only $7 a month. I have multiple businesses taking advantage of that where they just have their employees go through this stuff through sales, through entrepreneurship, through mindset every single day. Uh, it's $7 a month. Super easy to do that. And where, sorry, where, did, where, where will they find the course, Dom? It's on accountabilitynow.net. Accountabilitynow.net. And the Morning Jolt podcast, are you, uh, are you still progressing with that? Yeah, and you can listen to my podcast. Thank you. Uh, that's a great plug. You, you helped me out. Uh, my <laughs> Morning Jolt podcast, it's the Morning Jolt. It's on Apple. It's on Spotify. And we do short uh, sprints to help uh, business leaders and entrepreneurs and sales leaders just get a little insight to start their morning and get excited. That's the idea. Don, it's been brilliant having you on the show. Thank you very much for coming on. Some terrific ideas. I'm going to put all the links and some of the notes from what we've talked about in the show notes of the podcast so people can find it. But fantastic. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much for having me on.